in terms of uh, upcoming Grand Rounds uh, events or up upcoming department events, um, on uh, the uh, on the eighth next week, um, we have uh, B. J. Casey from the Department of Psychology, and I think she has a secondary appointment in our department, and. She's leading one of the leaders of the large national uh, longitudinal study of, uh, of uh, emotional, cognitive, and neural development through childhood into adolescence. That's called the ABCD study. And she's going to be talking about emergence of the adult brain, insights from cognitive and clinical neuroscience. That should be a great talk. And then the following week, the 15th, uh, Linda Carpenter, an alumnus of our department, uh, will be talking about uh, uh, transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation therapy for psychiatric disorders. Linda uh, has remained an expert in uh, mood and anxiety disorders, and that, that should be a, a good presentation and great to have Linda back. Um, uh, on the 15th, people w should have received a, a, an announcement from the department about a celebration. Uh, for the retirement of uh, Steve Southwick on the 12th. And uh, uh, so that should be a, a nice celebration. That will be at the Herrera Center at 6 o'clock? 5.30? It'll be at 6 o'clock, plus or minus. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So everybody can practice, get, get ready to have something to say at their retirement. Um, so, so it's my pleasure to, to introduce um, our Dean, Bob Alpern. And, and I've said it before, but it, it bears repeating uh, that Bob has been uh, probably the most supportive, uh, the Dean who's been the most supportive of the Department of Psychiatry uh, that, I can, that I can remember perhaps going back all the way to Fritz Redlich, who was probably very supportive of <laughs> psychiatry as dean. Uh, and, um, and, and we, under his depart medical school leadership, we have really thrived as a department um, and become um, part of the central infrastructure of, of the medical school through Richard's role as, as uh, a dean for educate deputy dean for education and Carolyn Missouri's role as uh, associate dean, um, and and our membership in in uh, all the major initiatives that the medical school has undertaken over the past several years. Um, so uh, so it's really with uh, with with special pleasure uh, and a little uh, bit of bittersweet. Uh, uh, it's a bit of a bittersweet moment to uh, introduce our Dean, Bob Belpern, uh, in, in his uh, uh, last year here, so <laughs> wonderful, thank you. Thanks, John. The, uh, so, so with that, I think I'll, I'll just head to the first slide. Uh, the, uh, it really has been a, a pleasure to be Dean here. And uh, uh, the 15 years seemed like they went really quickly. The, uh, I, I, it is bittersweet for me um, to walk away from this because I, I've enjoyed it so much. But it's, I'm also looking forward to <laughs> taking it easy. And uh, <laughs> as I told Gary Desir, who's going to be my chairman once I'm no longer dean, I said, I'll try not to be too annoying to him. <laughs> the, uh, so, but, but it really has been great. And I, I really appreciate uh, the faculty. It, it, it's, it, it's really fun to be the dean at Yale because there's just so much talent. And all you have to do is make sure you're feeding the talent and, and stay out of the, its way, and, and uh, it's been great. I, I do want to emphasize um, all initiatives are moving forward. Peter Salave and I discussed this, and you know, if you're wondering, is anything on hold? Nothing is on hold, and if you look at my calendar, it's just as bad as it was uh, a year ago. <laughs> The, uh, so, so don't worry about it, and uh, everything will move forward. So let me start with research. 
So um, this is the, uh, I, I think you all know that the president and the provost uh, announced uh, <coughs> some time ago that the major uh, emphasis for Yale University moving forward was to build up the sciences. And, uh, and that was welcome news. Um, and I, I, that's just a realization. Yale is unbelievable in the humanities and the arts. It's probably unequaled. Um, but that's not the currency of the future. The, you know, what, what's going to define the great universities of the next century is really going to be science and technology. And uh, Yale, we're very good in it, but we're, we're not. We don't stand out as the leader as a university. And, and I think they realize they need to get better. And uh, I've probably discussed this with you. They see their singular strength in that area as the biomedical sciences because of the medical school. So we're, we're well positioned to be in the center of that. So they appoint, the provost appointed this university science strategy committee, and they came up with these priorities. And I put in green the ones that, I'm sorry, in blue, the ones that involve the medical school. And so the cross-cutting investments, frankly, I think these are the most important, are uh, the ones that really help all the faculty. So investing in graduate student support, diversity in the science field, instrumentation development, and core facilities are, are really important. Uh, they identified uh, these top priority areas, and uh, the ones in blue were really already identified by us as our priorities. Uh, data science, neuroscience, and inflammation. I put in green uh, the environmental and evolutionary sciences, not because they're green, but because a different color. This is where it really going to involve largely the School of Public Health. Um, and then uh, additional priority areas, cancer, uh, precision medicine, which is genetics, and, and regenerative medicine. So the one thing that I want to say, because I've, I've reflected on this a lot uh, after they came up with the report and, and tried to, you know, one of the things I, I guess psychiatrists do, but I try to do, is I, I, I know what to do when uh, something presents itself, but then trying to understand why I do it. And, and, uh, and, and so that, that's what, because the, um, in medicine, it, it, it's always nice to have a strategic plan and to have priorities, but in medicine, everything's a priority. And, and so, and I always like to say, I never want to be the person to tell a patient that I've decided that your disease isn't that important. Uh, and, you know, so all diseases are important, and what we do is we look for advocates you know, among our faculty who have great ideas about how to work in an area, and then we support them. So, so I try to come up with our strategic plan for the medical school, and, and this is it. Uh, it's the continued recruitment and development of outstanding faculty as we seek to create and sustain an outstanding, interactive, and diverse intellectual community that addresses all of our missions. And this is what we do. And there, you know, I, I can speak to you as a nephrologist because in all my years in academic medicine, there is no university that has ever identified nephrology as one of its highest strategies. <laughs> it was Yale in the 1980s. I mean, that's true, yeah. Yeah, it was at Yale, but the, uh, and, and the problem is, as you will all recognize, that kidney disease affects poor people. It doesn't affect rich people. And when a disease doesn't affect rich people, somehow it's not a priority. Um, okay. So this is uh, <clears throat> the total grant dollars that uh, the medical school has gotten. The blue line is total dollars. The orange line is directs, and the green is indirects. But uh, basically, uh, the majority of our grant funding is from the NIH. And, and this is, if you plotted the NIH budget, it would look exactly the same. So, so this was, you know, went up every year. This was sequestration when the government uh, cut the NIH budget. And then this was, this upsweep is when the government had this epiphany that it actually could spend money it didn't have. And, uh, <laughs> 
And, and so now the NIH budget goes up every year, and, and it's just paid for by debt. Um, the interesting thing is we tried to understand um, how to predict what our research funding would be, and it's very hard to predict it. But one of the interesting things we found is that Yale gets 1.42 percent of the NIH budget every year. And it's amazing whether the NIH budget goes up or the budget goes down, it's always 1.42 percent, sometimes 1.41, sometimes 1.43, but it never really deviates much from that. Now, obviously, we'd like to get it to be a higher percentage, but it is interesting. Um, and, and one of the things that has really increased a lot is clinical trials here. So in 2006 was when YCCI was founded as a mechanism to support faculty who do clinical trials, and uh, we got the CTSA grant that year. This, this has been incredibly successful. So now there's an incredible amount of regulatory barriers to doing clinical trial. Now YCCI does all that for you. And, and we, we've basically offered it over these years as a service, but now we're getting to the point where we're not even going to let you do any of the regulatory stuff. We're not going to let you draw a contract because what we found is that when the PIs write up the contract with industry, nobody gets paid, whereas when we write up the contract, everybody gets paid. And, and so more and more, uh, they, we're actually going to ask the PIs to do the science and the medicine and leave the business to YCCI. So the clinical practice, uh, th this has been the most dramatic increase. The blue line is the total revenue. The green line is what we get from the payers, and the red line is what Yale New Haven Hospital gives us. And you can see Yale New Haven Hospital has gone from around 50 million a year to now 299 million a year, and this year in, in 19 it'll be well above uh, 300 million. The interesting thing, the cl total clinical revenue was under 300 million, and this year we're going to be way over a billion dollars a year in clinical revenue. Uh, and and th this is, frankly, um, it, it's a great thing. It shows the growth of the practice, and which is fantastic, but it also does generate revenue for the medical school, and I'll show you our finances. And this is a major reason why our finances look as good as they look. And I, I just showed you the $299 million that Yale New Haven Hospital gives us, but I, I thought it's useful to, for you to see a graph uh, that we, this is a table we use to analyze what it is. So the, if you look at the green, the hospital purchases services from us, and you know they've always done that, and that's reasonable. And, and then they support certain positions like the director of the psychiatry unit in the hospital and things like that, and, and that's all reasonable. The orange part is what you should note, which is th this is investment in programs that they didn't have to do. The, so, so this is their commitment to making us a great practice. You know, they, they benefit also, so we, the whole ship rises. But I, I just want you to know, more than half the funds now that are coming over from the hospital are investments by the hospital in our programs. Uh, some of this is new programs to get them started. It's a three-year commitment. Some of it is supportive programs that will always need to be supported because they can't, uh, they can't pay their expenses from uh, collections. And so this is a great partnership. The only problem is that the amount going to the dean's office in blue is way too small. <laughs> but other than that, this is a great partnership. Now, there are challenges ahead. And, and I have to tell you, th there's two sides of this. Um, so, you know, th there's a lot of things which I'm going to go through that suggest that, you know, we're in danger. That, that there's, there's danger lurking. Too much money is being spent on health care. It can't continue to rise at the rate it's been rising, and something bad is going to happen. And, and it, 
there's a feeling it's got to happen next year or the year after that. I just put a little caveat on that, that if I was speaking in 1990, I would have told you the same thing. The, uh, and so every year, we are thinking the same thing. And in spite of the fact that it hasn't occurred in 25 years, we're still thinking the same thing. <laughs> but it, it, healthcare can't keep going up at the rate it's going. And there are certain things that are obviously beginning to happen that are worrisome. Um, and so the population is aging, and there is no getting around that. We've done too good a job of keeping our patients alive. And with that, uh, the percentage of patients with commercial insurance is going down, and the percentage of patients on Medicare is going up. And Medicare pays a lot lower than commercial insurance. We get great commercial insurance rates. So that, so that, and, and that, that is a trend. It changes a little bit every year, but it's trends always in the same direction. The other is uh, the Willie Horton rule. Uh, which is that governments, when they're looking for money, they go where the money is, and they have identified health systems as a place that has a lot of money. And uh, so the, the state has gotten very good at rating Yale New Haven health system, and the federal government is trying to learn how to do it. And you know, the, Trump just went after all the 340B drugs and lowered the reimbursement on them, which was, was a huge loss to the health system, but the court stopped him and said he can't do it. But to be honest, I think Congress and the, the executive branch are aligned in wanting to cut these costs. So it, it's a matter of time. Huge capital investments have to be made. So the East Pavilion has to be replaced, and, and plans are being developed to do that now. The South Pavilion has to be replaced. We need ambulatory facilities. These all are going to involve capital investments. So with all that, we need to be efficient. And what, we need to get more efficient every year, because we're, we're probably going to be delivering more and more health care, but not with the same uh, proportionate increase in revenue. And, uh, and we, do, we rely on this revenue to support the practice, but also to support all of our other missions. So. Uh, one of the things you're going to be hearing a lot about is economies of scale and Yale Medicine's attempt to centralize a lot of things that can be done more efficiently. Project, oh, well, I'm going to talk about, uh, yeah, I will talk about access later. We need a high level of alignment uh, between the medical school and Yale Medicine and with the health system in NEMG. Um, and, you know, we're, we're partners. We, we, we have a very friendly relationship with each other, but we're still functioning as two separate units. And Marna and I are spending a lot of time trying to see how we can bring those together to function more. We'll always be two separate business entities, but can we function as a, a one virtual identity? We're working on a funds flow model that uh, might be more aligned with our strategies than the one we have now which is basically 19 departments that uh, eat what they kill. And uh, that's not really very strategic. Um, and then we have to have a real focus on patients and physicians. So patient access, uh, th this is our new program to basically have a centralized number, 1-800-I-WANT-A-DOCTOR. They call, and no matter what doctor they want, it will all be arranged with one phone call. Um, so this rolled out, I think, on Monday, the, the first thing. It, it's going through a series of departments, and they, they want to make sure they get it right so, so that people will not, I think, nephrology and the diabetes clinic, you, people will no longer be calling those clinics. If they try to call those clinics, it's going to roll to a central access thing. And uh, we want to get it really perfect, and then we're going to keep rolling it out. I think there's a three-year plan to get it through the uh, entire practice. Physician compensation I'm going to talk about later. And virtual scribe, which I'm not sure you can do that in psychiatry. Um, but basically, somebody listens in on the visit and uh, is typing a note. So the doctor doesn't have to sit there and, and write a note while they're meeting with the patient. 
And, and it turns out with that, the patients like the fact that the doctor's actually looking at them. And uh, the uh, physicians like it. We ran this as pilots because they, they actually don't go home to two hours of note writing every night. Um, and so the, in theory, this could pay for itself because a doctor would see more patients with this efficiency. Nobody thinks that's going to happen. And, and so really, we see this as something that's just making our physicians happier. And so we've just decided to pay for it. So it's all going to be paid for centrally. And the idea is that every doctor, nobody's going to be forced to use it, but every doctor will have two or three of their own scribes and who will, who will write their notes for them. And then the doctor still has to approve the note and can edit it. So education, I just want to talk about one thing, because the big news this year was that NYU went tuition free. And I think it's worth discussing. Um, so uh, the, to understand that you have to understand a few things. So the total cost of medical education is tuition, living expenses, books, and other fees. So if you go on NYU's website, uh, they have th these other expenses amount to $30,000 a year. And they don't really provide financial aid for those $30,000. So if you are poor and you go to NYU tuition-free, you will pay $30,000 a year to go there. Uh, we operate, as most medical schools do, with the concept of the unit loan, which is an amount a student's expected to borrow each year to cover the total cost of education. So no student should ever borrow more than the unit loan. And we will provide scholarships to make sure they don't borrow more than the unit loan. So what does that mean? So a year ago, uh, we actually lowered our unit loan from $30,000 to $23,000. So no student should borrow more than $23,000 a year if they have no money, if they come to Yale. So just to be clear, somebody who has no money who goes to NYU tuition free is going to pay $30,000 a year. If they come to Yale, they're going to pay $23,000 a year. So it's actually a better deal at Yale. On the other hand, if you're rich, <laughs> it's a better deal at NYU <laughs> because we're going to make you pay for everything and they're still going to let you come tuition free. So basically, tuition free is financial aid for the wealthy. Um, so, so we lowered our unit loan. We increased in calculating how much a student should have to borrow. We have to calculate what the parent should pay. And uh, believe this or not, in 2007, if a parent made more than $45,000 a year, they were expected to contribute to tuition. We raised it in 2008 to 100,000, and a year ago we raised it to 125,000, and then it gradually comes in between 125 and 165. So with that, the average debt nationally for a student going to medical school in the, to a private school in the U.S. is $192,000 a year when they graduate. At Yale, it's been $121,000. And I will tell you that 192 is a bell-shaped curve. And, and so there are schools that are up at $300,000. Um, we think with this change, it should be four times the unit loan. So we think the debt of our students is actually going to go down below $100,000. And we'd like to get it lower. So uh, what's the goal? To me, the goal is a unit loan of zero, and which means that any student could come to Yale School of Medicine without debt. So I think debt-free should be our mantra. And, and l let me say, this is what all the Ivy League undergraduate schools do. This is what most of the top medical schools do. Nobody gets a free ride to Yale College who has a lot of money. And um, I, I just asked the philosophical question, do you think we should be tuition free for those who have the money and can afford to pay for it? Because I can tell you, it would probably cost about $20 million a year, and that's $20 million a year that the medical school could spend on psychiatry or other <laughs> academic <laughs> programs. And, and would you rather not have that money and give away Yale for free for people who can afford it? 
And I don't think so. I, don't, I think we're worth paying for if people have the money. But if people don't have the money, we want them to come here debt free. And I think that's what should be our goal. And it's not, I, I think we can get there actually. We're, we're not that far. So finance, I'm going to show you one slide to give, which it's, it looks complicated, but I'm only going to go through a few rows. Um, but this will give you a sense of where the medical school is sitting now, because there's two issues. How big are our reserves, and what's our operating budget? And so, so this is the dean's office budget. This is the central funds. This is when John needs to recruit somebody and comes to the dean's office and says, can you give us money to help us recruit? This is the budget that determines whether the answer is yes or no. Um, and uh, so um, the, I'm not going to go through all these lines, but needless to say, there's a lot of indirects have gone up and the clinical revenue's gone up. Um, and this is the bottom line down here. So if, if you went back to like FY, if you went back to 05 and 06, we had a $35 million deficit in the dean's office every year. We turned that around, and in FY10 to FY14, I'd say we averaged a three to five million dollar surplus, which I used to celebrate every year and used to say, you know, if we're in the, any year where the bottom line is in the black is a good year. Um, but things did get much better in uh, the last few years. And, and so the key thing is, um, which I just want to, this line here, Dean's Dowry, this was money that the provost uh, gives to the, or the president gives to the medical school. And Rick Levin, when he hired me, the medical school, because we're in such massive deficit and he really wanted to fix it, he was very generous. And so we were able to make a lot of academic investments even while we were in deficit because of the money Rick sent over. Uh, but the, you know, then we were coming out of deficit and Ben Pollack, the new provost, reasonably said, you know, we shouldn't be sending this much. You're actually doing better than the rest of the university, and it's time to stop sending the money to you. So FY14, there was a $25 million dowry, but when I negotiated with Ben for this term, the agreement was that we would taper down to $10 million a year. And, uh, and that was painful. I actually thought we were going to go into deficit at the time, because you can see we were break even that year. Um, to help us through it, he, we negotiated a deal that the other deans had gotten in the self-support schools, which takes me down to these two lines here, university services and university services direct allocation. But the agreement was that the university service charge, no matter how much they increase their costs, we pay them for services, the charge wouldn't go up more than inflation minus 1%. So I thought this was a big deal and this was a little deal. It turned out that this was a little deal and this was a huge deal. <laughs> so because university services went up by $35 million more than inflation minus 1%. So, so what we sent to the university is $35 million less than we would send if, our, if we had to pay the costs. And, and you know, everybody says, well, how could that be, and what was it? And I don't understand all of it, but a lot of it's IT. And, uh, and Yale was really far behind in IT, and frankly, we're still behind in IT, and, and probably we're always going to be behind in IT. And it's just a question of, of when you absolutely have to invest. And they have had to make some investments, and I think you're all aware of Workday. Um, so the bottom line is, as you can see, we've had great surpluses in these years. So it was 4 million, then it went up to 9, then 20 million, 26.8. 27 million is what we're projecting based on the Q2. Uh, we closed out the second quarter. This is what we think the year will close out at. So with this, we are going to have really good reserves in the, in the medical school and probably around $125 million. You know, we used to have reserves of 10 million, 15 million, you know, and, and 
I've had to, unfortunately, when you have a provost who's an economist, it's hard to pull anything over on them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, how much reserve should a medical school have? The word people say is 25% of your budget. But to be honest, as Ben would say, who knows? And, and there's no evidence. But I can tell you 125 million is better than 10 million. Um, the problem, and, and so, so you'd say, that's great. We're accumulating all this money. And to be honest, we're trying to spend it. Um, and I know you'd be happy to help us. Um, but th this is what's looming, is that th this deal was a five-year deal. All the other self-support schools got it at Yale. But they got it like a year or two ahead of us, and then they lost it. The provost is that he's not doing it again. And so every school's going to pay their costs. So our assessments are going up by $35 million next year. Uh, and um, I think I, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that the provost will not be moved on that. Um, so. Um, the, and what that means is we're projecting a small deficit uh, in FY20. The, um, and, and so I, there are actually things I want to increase in spending on, but, but I don't want to, uh, some, uh, some of the, the one-time expenses are easy because we have the reserves. The recurring expenses, we got to be a little careful so that we don't end up in, in too large a deficit in FY20. But to be honest, I'm pretty happy that this is only a $4 million deficit we're projecting. If you would have asked me two years ago, we were projecting an almost a $20 million deficit in FY20. So things keep getting better. And I think it'll be no problem to grow out of this so long as the grant revenue and, and the clinical revenue keep growing. Uh, but if they don't, it could be a problem. So, so just so you understand, the, this is what we're facing going forward. So I always like to spend some time on climate, and, and so I want to uh, just cover some of the things going on now. So we're in the midst of forming the clinician track. I, I think you know when we did a lot of the climate studies, we found that one of the things, one of the uh, groups of faculty that were most unhappy with the clinicians, and one of the issues that they were most unhappy about was being unable to be promoted uh, as clinician educators. So um, I wasn't here. Steve Bunny was probably here for the fight. In 1996, uh, the uh, provost uh, gave in and let the medical school form the clinician educator track. I'm told that Allison Richards at the time thought this would be the end of academics at the medical school, and uh, that it, she, she, she was brought to this decision kicking and screaming. <laughs> and um, she put limits on the size of the number of professors that could be on the clinician educator track. But the idea was is that you had to be a clinician, and you had to be an educator, and you had to do them both with excellence, as is implied in the title. What's not implied in the title is that you also had to have academic excellence that leads to a national and international reputation. So this was not the academic excellence that's required on the tenure track, but it was still serious academic excellence. And, and to be honest, it's been really terrific. So I chair the senior a and committee, and I can tell you the faculty that get promoted on the CE track are fabulous. And they really are national leaders. And you know they, they do things like set clinical guidelines for the country and things like that. So it's not published in nature or science, but it, it is re they really are the clinical leaders of the country. And, and the accomplishments are very diverse and really impressive. And Yale is a much better school because we have the clinician educator track. But we have a lot of clinicians who want to see patients, and they care more about if the patient is in the room with them than what people in California think of them. And they could not get promoted on this track. So we formed the clinical track. And uh, this year, so we used to employ these people under a title called clinician. They were not ladder faculty. This year, they became ladder faculty. <coughs> And, uh, and now we're working out the criteria for promotion so that next year we'll be able to promote them. So they kind of stayed in rank this year. 
Um, but uh, we no longer, we don't have a category of employment called clinician that is not on a, a ladder track faculty. And the key thing here is we're not going to be looking for what the national or international reputation is. We're going to be looking for what the local and regional reputation is. And, and, and this bar is not going to be low. So, so every, when the clinician educator track was formed, everybody thought that was going to be a low bar and a humiliating track to be on. And then the bar turned out to be really high and it's actually an honor. The people who are on that track are honored to be on that track. This is going to be the same way. Our view is a professor on the clinician track is going to be your master clinician. The person you go to when you have a difficult patient, who, who would you, who's the person you want to get their opinion? That's going to be the professor on the clinical track. And so the quality of clinician that will be required on the clinical track will be higher than on the clinician educator track, because the clinician educator track will have other things. So um, another issue, so I, I like to say, I, I like to quote the New York Times whenever I'm not mentioned in the article. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> so <laughs> the, the absence of paid leave and other family-friendly policies has been found to be the major reason that more women aren't working in the United States. And the reason American parents say they are unhappier than non-parents and parents in other countries. And so th this article was written about Gavin Newsom, the new governor in Connecticut, who wants to require <laughs> six months of paid parental leave uh, provided by every employer in the state of, of California. He has a great plan. It's just missing one little characteristic, which is he has no idea how to pay for it. Um, but it was interesting, after I did this slide for the first time a few weeks ago, Tamash Horvath uh, in comparative medicine, I gave this talk to comparative medicine, and he, he told me that when he grew up in Hungary that the, they gave three years of parental leave for every child that was born, and his mother had three children three years apart, and for nine years she didn't show up at work. <laughs> so um, the reason I show this is because, and, and this is the shout out to the Faculty Advisory Council, um, they really led the way on this. To be honest, I, I've been here for many years and I didn't even know it was an issue. Um, and the FAC brought this up that uh, Yale's policy was that you had to be a primary caregiver so, to get parental leave. So you had to provide more than 50% of the caregiving, and you can do the math pretty fast, you can't have two primary caregivers. So by definition, only one spouse was able to t get parental leave. The, um, and so we got rid of that. And uh, the provost agreed to this. And so now you just need to be a caregiver. So, so Ben Pollack still wants to make sure he's still a little concerned that the, someone will have a child and the father will go skiing for a month. Um, so he doesn't want to support that. Now, he's not going to check on it, but he wants to be assured that the, both parents are, are providing care. And if they do, then they can both take the leave, which right now this paid leave is two months. I think most of you know in the United States there is no requirement. For, parent, for paid parental leave. There is a legal requirement that you can't fire someone for taking off unpaid, but there's no requirement that you have to pay them. And so Yale does provide two months of paid parental leave, and now it'll be for both parents. Also, to make sure that clinical departments don't put any pressure on the person taking off, we have a central set of funds now that will be provided to the department to pay for clinical effort so that if one of your clinical faculty takes parental leave, we will pay their salary from central funds for those two months so John can use that money to pay for someone to fill in. And there should be no pressure on that faculty member to make up for the clinical time they missed either before they take off or after they take off. 
and, and we ha Tracy Larmer will be available to answer questions for people who are interested in taking parental leave. Childcare, <laughs> so we, we've always subsidized childcare here. We, we now have two childcare campuses on the medical school campus, the North, Phila North Campus of Phyllis Bodell and the South Campus of Phyllis Bodell. So we still have to uh, monitor this because the, there's unlimited need for child care. The, one of the things that is still a problem is the hours of the Phyllis Bodell Center. And we, we've actually encouraged them to extend their hours, e even offering to pay for it. They don't want to do it. They, 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 their employees don't want to work those extended hours. So, so we'll see. This is going to be a work in progress. But it, it still hampers, it, hurt, it hurts some of our faculty that it's the Phyllis Bodell Center closes whenever it closes. Um, so we want to celebrate our diversity. And, and so uh, coming up soon is the annual Perspectives of Women in Medicine Science Lecture, which are the MD-PhD program organized in uh, uh, this year, there's, uh, not only is Joan Stites going to give the uh, talk, the lecture, but they're going to have a half-day symposium to honor her and a uh, dinner beforehand. Um, the other interesting thing, and I think you've done something with your artwork in this department, uh, so we formed a committee, the uh, Yale School of Medicine Committee on Art and Public Spaces to address uh, art portraiture. And um, it's interesting. So as part of this, we actually hired an undergraduate student to study the portraits we have up at the medical school and to actually find out who these people are. <laughs> and it turns out that actually, uh, other than the last five or six deans, we don't have a clue who any of these people are who have these <laughs> portraits. And, and some of them have never been at Yale, we've learned. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> they actually donated their portrait to Yale. And I guess they were trying to fill the walls or something. Um, so you know, I, I, th this is obviously a big philosophical issue. You know, Yale is a school that's th the university. It's 300 years old, and it has all these traditions. And the portraits really demonstrate the traditions. And it's really the portraiture, when you see it, it tells you what Yale was. But the portraits don't really show what Yale is. And, and that's the problem. So we, we don't really, um, you know, it, it's great to honor all the past provosts and the past presidents and, of course, the past deans. but. You know, th there's nothing there that really shows who we are today. And, and so th this committee is actually, I think there's two committees or subcommittees. One is looking at exhibits that we're going to have at the medical school, and the other is looking at the portraiture. And, uh, and I, so I can tell you um, that there is a portrait of Carolyn Slayman that is going to be unveiled shortly, uh, which we uh, commissioned. Uh, this, I put, have here a picture of Dorothy Horseman. Um, who uh, some of you may know. So Dorothy is a, was a virologist who uh, made a seminal discovery, which was how to culture the polio virus. And without her discovery, there would be no polio vaccines. Um, so you can imagine the impact of that. And to honor her, we have a scrunched up photograph that is colorized. Huh? colorized. Color, oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, I mean, it's, it's so bad. And it's, it's, on the, it's in the hallway from my office to the Beaumont room. And um, so we are, we are having her portrait painted. Um, and so it, it, this photograph is like one third the size. And, and it's literally all wrinkled. And, um, I, and I, I have to tell you, when I we went to paint Carolyn Slayman's portrait. Cl and and cl we're, we're paying for it, but Clifford Slayman, who's a frugal person, said, Th that's ridiculously expensive. We should just put up a photograph of her. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Clifford, you're killing me. I'm going to have these uh, oil paintings of all the men, and I'm going to have photographs of all the women. <laughs> the, uh, 
So um, anyway, so this is something we are working on. And the other thing we are working on is a portrait of the first three African-American women to come to Yale Medical School. And uh, Darren Lattimore, I was going to have the same artist do it, and Darren corrected me and said, no, this will be done by an African-American artist. <laughs> Um, faculty compensation, so if, if you don't, if people don't believe they are fairly paid, then actually nothing else matters. And so I think you all know we've been having these annual meetings for four years in a row, and we'll be doing it again in April and May this year. And I think the next dean is going to be really mad at me for these, because this wipes out two months. Uh, but it's a really great process. And so we go through uh, every faculty member, um, and we discuss where they are, their progress with the chair, about 10 people sitting and listening. And, the, um, uh, and so, so uh, the, we, start, we did this in FY15 for the FY16 budget. And you can see the, that we've made significant increases in salary. This is the percentage of the faculty who got their salaries increased. This is the average increase in the salary. The, uh, we do it for men, for women, for all races, but it did turn out the first year there were a lot more women that needed be, to be corrected than men. It's still always a little more women that need to be corrected than men. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, the chairs have been totally bought into this. They, that the having 10 sets of eyes looking at this is better than one set of eyes. But every time the group identifies a salary that needs to be corrected, the chair never says, I don't know how I'll pay for it. The chair always says, I'll, I want to fix this. So um, the, uh, and the other thing that's come out of this process, although it wasn't envisioned at the time, is it's allowed a discussion of the career progression of each of the faculty. And, and this has been great. So especially one of the columns is years in rank. And so we can see people who are sitting in rank for a long time, and we have that discussion. The, um, so, so this process that I just described makes sure that within psychiatry, there is equity, that everyone within psychiatry is paid fairly. What it doesn't do is say, is the department as a whole paid fairly? And, you know, and, and how do you compare how you're paying psychiatrists to neurosurgeons? And you know, obviously, they're not going to make the same amount of money, but are they being treated equitably compared to neurosurgeons? So we have hired Sullivan, Sullivan Cotter to basically do that analysis <coughs> of how we should deal with compensation. And this is going to affect our funds flow and, and how we uh, flow funds between departments. In, and I think you know we also have the transparency statements that uh, tell you how your salary compares to those at other Northeast medical schools and, and to other faculty at Yale. Um, so mentoring and leadership, uh, Yale Medicine was probably the first out of the gate on this. They, they Paul Tahiri soon after he got here, uh, established this course at the School of Management. It was emerging leaders. And then it, the faculty liked it so much they have a course of advanced leaders. And it, it's paid for by Yale Medicine and Yale New Haven Hospital. And it's uh, put on by the School of Management. It's a, it, the faculty really like it. It's one Friday a month for the whole year. Um, I think they spend the day there. And it's been a great hit. The medical school's also done things. So we've had. Uh, we, we send one to two faculty a year to ELAM, uh, which is a, a leadership uh, course for women. Um, and a number of members of this department have done it. Um, the other thing, I, a lot of our young scientists found out that you know, even though they're junior, they actually need leadership training to run their labs. And so they went and they, took, they found this course in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, and the, uh, it teaches a young principal investigator how to lead their lab. The interesting thing is after a number of years of our faculty going to Germany, we found out that the course is put on by a company in Boston. <laughs> and uh, so we, we actually are now putting, doing the course here. 
off campus and, and just for our faculty. And we're, we're going to run all the faculty through it. We've offered it to Yale College, and they're very excited about it. We also have our junior PIs meet monthly. We give them lunch, and they just share ideas. Another program that we have is a coaching program for new Right now, it's for new chairs, and when we work through the new chairs, uh, we'll co cover some of the existing chairs. But the, the idea is this program was designed for new chairs. And this guy, Ken Kraft, who's at Harvard, does this for the Brigham and the MGH. And the idea is that when a chair is appointed, he lets them sit in place for six months to a year, basically let people see the strengths and weaknesses. Then he comes and personally does a 360. Uh, not one of these Yale forms, but he actually meets with people, identifies things they're doing well, things they could do better, and then he goes through eight coaching sessions with the chair. So, so this is a coaching program to make a good chair better, not to make a bad chair a good chair. <laughs> the, uh, hopefully we won't have that. But I want to emphasize the most important uh, mentoring and coaching it has to occur in the departments. And there's nobody who can mentor a young psychiatry faculty member better than a psychiatry faculty member. And uh, so we have formal mentoring programs in place in all the departments. I think there is some variability in how good they are. So we, we've decided to uh, form a new position, an associate dean for faculty affairs, whose major goal is going to be to interact with the departments on their mentoring programs and really understand them and make sure that everyone is using best practices. So coming down to the end, um, so we appointed a committee a few years ago to uh, meet with uh, various members of that constituency and decide what the values should be for the medical school. And that's at the top of this uh, slide. So excellence plus was excellence in academics, but also excellence in the other things in this bar. Respect, collaboration. We, our faculty don't want to be alone. They don't like the fact that the academic system rewards you for your individual efforts. Autonomy, that's autonomy from the bureaucracy, autonomy from the dean, uh, so that you can do what you want, you can express yourself, transparency. And those first five were actually came up from our faculty. The student on the committee came up with uh, service and, uh, and making the world a better place. And so, so it's interesting. I, I think I told you this last year that on the Maslow scale of needs. The first five that the faculty came up with are all related to survival and, and interaction. They're like at the bottom of the pyramid. And the students are at level seven, at the top. And I, I think I told you this. I, I want to do a research project and follow the student to see when he goes from level seven down to level one. The, um, but uh, one of the things that's come out, this is all an iterative process, and we realized that there's three things we needed to focus on. Uh, so that, as I told you, the clinicians are living challenging lives. And so over 50% of our clinicians say that they're burned out. And, and that's about similar to the national average. Um, and so we formed a s specific committee on clinician well-being. A faculty engagement, we, it's great, we've grown, we're up to 3,000 faculty now, but that's led to a feeling a lot of faculty don't feel that they really matter to the school, and they're lost in the crowd, and so they, the term that people use is they don't feel engaged. Um, and so we're trying to, uh, un, people who feel unengaged are not happy. And so we're trying to see what we could do to create a sense of more engagement. And then having you know, leadership, how do you choose the right leaders? How do you train them and mentor them? So we formed a committee on that. And um, what we did for this is we chose co-chairs for each of the committees. And then we didn't choose the committee. We let the co-chairs choose their committees. And, and so we got a very diverse group of committee members. And uh, the, each committee has defined how they're going to approach this. 
And I actually don't go to their meetings, but I meet monthly with the chairs to see what their progress is, and they're all heading in their own direction. And it's been really great. We're hoping we're going to get most of their uh, reports by uh, March through May. Um, and they're coming up with a lot of innovative ideas. So one of the things that became clear as we were doing this is that there, there was one area that we're not really covering that these committees don't cover, and that's uh, part of the Excellence Plus is respect. And, um, the, uh, and th that falls under, uh, wh when I think of respect, um, so we, we're calling this creating a more respectful Yale School of Medicine, and we basically want to eliminate sexual, gender, and racial harassment, microaggressions, and bias, and all forms of bullying. And, um, and so how do you do that? You know, it, so we know how to punish it you know, when it's identified, but how do you actually prevent it? And um, so you know, I think we really have to galvanize the entire academic community to embrace a commitment to and responsibility for a respectful environment free of sexual, gender, and, se sexual and racial harassment and all forms of disrespect and bullying. And um, so how do you do that? So it clearly has to start in the dean's office, and uh, everybody has to believe the dean is committed to it. Um, and, you know, and then it's got to involve the chairs, and we've had many meetings with the chairs to discuss this issue. Um, but that's not going to change anything. And then the chairs need to come back to their departments and talk to section chiefs and vice chairs. But in the end, if, if we're really going to change the culture where everybody thinks, it's, it's got to involve students, faculty, staff, residents. Um, and uh, so that, that's the challenge. And uh, you know, when you add up all those groups, we're probably more like 7,000 people. Um, so to make an initial step on this, we, uh, Darren uh, Lattimore, who's working with me on this, we sent out an email to the community in November, I think, and uh, basically said we want to take this on and who wants to be involved. And we got back a lot of responses. We sent it to faculty, students, and staff. And uh, the, we then sent an email to the chairs and told them who had volunteered in their department and said, is there anyone else that really should be involved in this that just didn't respond to the email? And we got more names. Um, and so we're planning to have a retreat um, and we were hoping to do it in February, but we have some speakers we've identified, and they're not available until May. Um, and so we're going to do it in May. The, um, and the idea is to really just get off campus and try to come up with a strategy of how to address this. And th this is going to be iterative. And so we will like, we're going to decide on the retreat how to address it, but we will likely form a committee, and the idea would be to develop an initial plan and implement it, and then to just keep modifying it. And so this committee is not a committee that's going to write a report. Um, this committee is a committee that's just going to get going working and, and, uh, and see what happens. And uh, so, so th this, I think, will be defined with time. And uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention.